Good morning and welcome to worship on this really beautiful Sunday morning. It's going to be warm, it's going to be sunny, and we are making that transition, aren't we? They say March comes in like a lamb and out like a lion. Let's hope it, see how it goes. Well, depends. If it, if it comes in like a lion, it goes out like a lamb. If it comes in like a lion, whatever. Glad to begin the month of March together. And next Sunday, a reminder, will be the time change. So move your clocks ahead next uh, Sunday morning so you won't be late for church. As uh, you heard on the organ, we're continuing with the theme, the seven last words of Christ from the cross. Um, there's a beautiful uh, selection of Haydn's movements around that theme. And thank you, Eric, for that beautiful prelude leading us into worship. And of course, on the first Sunday of the month, we'll gather around the Lord's table together. So it's a special time to be together as a church family, and that will be our focus today. We are the family of God in this place, and we should be working on names and name tags, so make sure you wear yours. Forgot mine. Sorry about that. (laughs) And if you haven't already done so, take the friendship pad and register your attendance with us. So now let us uh, turn our hearts to worship. As you hear the sound of the bells, please stand and join in our call to worship. The heavens are telling the glory of God. All nature proclaims God's handiwork. Let our prayer and praise reflect the love of God. With believers in every time and place, let us worship God. Friends, it's time to share our prayer of confession to acknowledge our need for God's grace in our lives. First in unison, and then pausing for a moment of silent and personal prayer. Let us pray together. Holy God, hear our prayer for the mending of our hearts torn apart by unkindness, for the healing of our souls wasting away from the despair around us, for the forgiveness we seek for the sin we have allowed to persist, for the reconciliation of the world whose division condemns us. We pray for the courage to admit our fault, the strength to amend our actions, and the hope that your grace awaits us. Through Christ we pray, amen. Friends, we have truly good news to share with one another on this third Sunday of Lent. Scriptures ask this question, who is in a position to condemn us? Only Christ. And yet Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Indeed, Christ prays for us. Whoever is in Christ, the old life is dead and gone, and the new life has begun anew again this day. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are indeed forgiven. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you. Thank you. Gracious God, we thank you for the joy we feel in this sanctuary this morning, in this living room of your family, your church family, as we gather together to be together and to worship you. We gather around this table that is our family table together. 
We gather to remember all that you have done for us and all that we have because of you. We thank you for these joys that were mentioned this morning, these answered prayers, these long marriages, the, these children that bring such joy to our lives. We thank you for each one of those blessings. And yet we have concerns in our hearts. We have loved ones that we care about that are going through a difficult time at this moment. When we took look around our world, we see much violence and, and loss of life and children suffering in, in Gaza and Ukraine and, and homeless situations in our cities and the migrant population with inadequate places to live. Lord, we ask that you come alongside each of those situations, especially we pray this day for peace. May those working on peace be empowered to find a way forward that would respect human life in Gaza and in Israel and in Russia and Ukraine and in all the troubled places of our world. We pray these things in the name of the Prince of Peace, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. The first reading today is from Psalm 19. The heavens are telling the glory of God. They are a marvelous display of his craftsmanship. Day and night, they keep on telling about God. Without a sound or a word, the sun lives in the heavens where God placed it and moves out across the skies as a radiant as a bridegroom going to his wedding or as a joyous as an athlete looking forward to a race. The sun across the heaven from end to end and nothing can hide from its heat. God's laws are perfect. They protect us, make us wise, and give us joy and light. God's laws are pure, eternal, just. They are more than desirable than gold. They are sweeter than honey dripping from a honeycomb. They are warn us from harm and give us success to those who obey them. But how can I ever know what sins are lurking in my heart? Cleanse me from these hidden faults and keep me from deliberate wrongs. Help me to stop by doing them. Only, they can, only then can I be free from guilt and innocent of some great crime. May my spoken words and unspoken thoughts be pleasing even to you. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel reading comes from this time, the Gospel of John, of these seven last words, a very special reading. We'll pick it up in chapter 19, verses 23 through 27. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. This dual instruction to his mother and, you might say, his best friend, the beloved disciple, are the most intimate words Jesus shared from those hours he was on the cross. These words are last wishes conveyed to the two people who knew him best and loved him most. Of the seven last words from the cross, they are the most personal. They're full of compassion, for the people gathered at the foot of the cross, but they are words of wisdom for you and me as well. 
They are words about our responsibility to one another. And they are words that our world desperately needs to hear. I'm using the older RSV, Revised Standard Version, translation throughout this message, mainly because it uses the word behold. The more contemporary translations say it more simply with words like, woman, here is your son. Somehow, behold your son and behold your mother has more gravitas than simply to say, here you go, you get along now. This is the third week of Lent, and this is the third of the seven last words of Jesus from the cross, and that, of course, has been our focus this Lent. And I've been looking forward to this week because this word or these words are my favorite, if that's an appropriate thing to say about Scripture. The other words that we've looked at and will look at are powerful and full of theological insights, but this one, this word is special. It's about family. It's about what was most important to Jesus, and it is about what should be most important to us. As they say in those Fast and Furious movies, if you've watched those, it's about family. But before we look into the implication of these words themselves, we should look at them, take a moment to reflect on who else was there at the foot of the cross. According to John, there were two other Marys there to keep vigil along with the mother of Jesus. There was Mary Magdalene, who of course is described in all the Gospels as one of the most devoted followers of Jesus. But there was also a woman named Mary who is said to be the sister of Mary and the wife of Clopas. We don't know exactly who this person is. This is the only place in the Gospel that mentions this Mary or even Clopas. There is a Cleopas who was one of the two disciples who walked with Jesus on the Emmaus Road in the Gospel of Luke. But it seems that Clopas is a unique creation of John's narrative. In the second century, some early Christian writers speculated that this Clopas was the brother of Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus and husband to Jesus' mother. So that would make this Mary an aunt to Jesus and sister-in-law to the mother of Jesus. By the way, when we think of this woman as an aunt of Jesus, do you say aunt or aunt? <laughs> I grew up with aunt, Aunt Dorothy, Aunt Mabel, but somewhere along the way, aunt started to become the pronunciation. Is it just me, or did I miss something, or is it a regional thing? How many of you say aunt? How many of you say aunt? Okay, so aunt still wins. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, anyway, what do we notice about this gathering at the foot of the cross? We always note that it was the women who were the first to gather to find the risen Christ at the empty tomb. But here we also see that it was the women who kept vigil with Jesus, while all the other men, Peter, James, all the others, except the beloved disciple, they ran for cover. They were cowards. This vignette is another testament to the foundational role of women in the Christian faith. Where would we be without the women of the church? It's a historical question. We, of course, know the answer. And yet most church leaders are still men. We like to criticize the Roman Catholic Church for excluding women from the priesthood, but we're not doing much better as Presbyterians. Our presbytery happens to be led by some gifted women on our staff, but our churches, and especially the larger ones in our Presbytery still have mostly men as pastors. If Jesus trusted the women of the movement to carry the memory of his death and resurrection, we too should trust women to lead our churches. Just, just saying. <laughs> In his chapter on this word from the cross, Adam Hamilton draws attention to the incomparable role of one of those women, the mother of Jesus, and the role that she has had on our faith. Ironically, those same Catholics who refuse to ordain women to the priesthood lift up the mother of Jesus as the Theotokos, the God-bearer. She gave birth to Jesus, raised him, watched him grow into a man with a purpose and a message. She followed him in his ministry and then watched him suffer 
and die. Michelangelo's Pietà in the St. Peter's Basilica in Rome captures the pain and pathos of that moment exquisitely. Hamilton points out how her grief and pain can be a comfort to parents who have lost a child. Any parent who has had that terrible experience knows it is a unique pain. It is out of the natural order to stand at the graveside of a child. They should stand at ours. Jesus' mother felt that pain, and she is willing to walk with you in your grief. I may be getting a little out there for a Presbyterian, but I think Hamilton is right. We are told about the mother of Jesus and her grief for a reason. She represents more than just her personal loss. She grieves for all of us who have lost children. She grieves for all children who are lost. She is grieving for the children lost in Gaza, children who are living in shelters, children who are abused. And that is another point that Hamilton takes from this last word of Jesus from the cross. He was telling two people to go ahead and take care of each other, but the words, behold your mother and behold your son, means so much more. It is an imperative of our Lord's dying breath that we care for the next generation, our son, as well as the one who has gone before, our mother. Hamilton gave examples of people who heard those words in a very literal way, behold your mother and behold your son. He described our responsibility to care for our seniors in our community. They are family. When he first came to Mount Kisco, Elizabeth, along with her friend Mary Panetti, delivered food through the food pantry to some of our most needy seniors, and she was shocked to see some of the substandard living conditions right here in our community. Behold your mother. We must work together to ensure decent housing and food and health care for all our seniors. I'm proud of what this church did to uh, provide attractive, affordable housing for low to moderate income seniors in our community. In the 1960s, under the leadership of the Reverend Lee Fairchild, whose portrait is out in our narthex, this church took advantage of a federal program known as Mitchell Lama to build a 70-unit complex in Bedford Hills. It's one of the best kept secrets in our church that we are part of that great facility. But we're trying to change that. And over 50 of us went caroling at the Fellowship Hall, it's called, uh, last December. It was such a joyful experience, it instantly became a classic, something we have to do as part of our Advent celebrations going forward. Caroling is nice, but we can do more. Behold Your Mother is a call to serve all the seniors and care for all the seniors in our lives, first in our own families, then in our church family, and then in our community and beyond. We love our seniors here at PCMK. We've honored you, I'll speak to you directly, in the past with special lunches and coffee hours, and your deacons are working ways to assure you of our ongoing love and devotion. Behold Your Son is similarly more than an instru in instruction between two people on that day in history. It is a call to see all children as our own. Hamil Hamilton told a powerful story of a teacher who took under his wing a young boy whose mother had died and whose father was unable to care for him properly. After sharing the details of the story, he acknowledged that it was very personal to him. That boy married his daughter. He was now literally part of his family. And he was grateful that a teacher heard those words, behold your son, and cared for someone else's son as if he were his own. The next generation is a responsibility for us all to share. We should do all we can to ensure quality education, opportunity, and health care for all children. We should focus on the living children who are here now rather than claim to care for embryos that are frozen in a lab somewhere. We can debate when life begins, but we have children who have real needs, 
right now. One group of forgotten children are those caught in the foster care system. Every once in a while, I get a letter from foster family services in our county asking if we know of a family who would take in foster children. I realize it is a huge commitment, but it can be truly rewarding for both the child and the family. It takes a special gift, but maybe there is someone in our church community who feels that call. And I can assure you that we would come alongside you and share in that responsibility. Because our master says, behold your son. Finally, behold your mother, behold your son, is a reminder that we are all family. We're part of the human family, we're part of the Christian family, and we're part of this church family. And like any family, one of the most important important times is when we gather at the family table. And in a moment, we will come to our family table once again. As you come, may you recognize your brothers and sisters here in this place. May, may you remember that all those in need, whether they be young or old, are part of God's family, part of our family. And may you hear these timeless words from the cross just for you. Behold, you are family. Amen. Let us prepare our hearts to come to the Lord's table together as we bring forward our tithes and offerings. Good to be together as the family of God as we begin the month of March together, which reminds me there are new, uh, ver um, the upper room, uh, they go by every two months. There's a new upper room there for March and April. Pick that up on the North X counter with daily devotional readings if you would like. Thank you, Carmen, for hosting our coffee hour today. Come and enjoy some fellowship together as families are wont to do. And if you'd like to pick up that book or join us in a midweek discussion, that would be great as well. There's a table there for that. What a wonderful reminder from our Lord in his dying moments that we are family. We're beloved to one another. We are beloved to him. We are beloved to each other. Let's care for one another as family. Let's think of all God's children as our family and our responsibility together. Now receive this benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you. And all God's people said, amen.